Hey guys, uh, Jim Turn One C, walkthrough ready to go. Um, I'll probably get one D done soon. Um, again, the exam got pushed back, so I'm not really stressed to get out one D. Um, one D is a bit of a difficult one, just to kind of make some comments on it. It's it's a little bit harder than you would expect for the class. Um, yeah, definitely a bit harder than the one you would expect for this class. Um, but it does hit all the core concepts. Um, and I would highly suggest, I mean, if you could do 1D, um, very, if you understand all the concepts you can and do very well on it, you probably take the midterm next week um, with your eyes closed. So, I mean, I'll get it out, but I'll tell you what, if, if that one was you know causing any stress or anxiety, uh, yeah, it's kind of a hard exam. So no stress, no, no worries on that. Um, but 1C is the last exam that's sort of within the realms of what you might be asked to do. Um, and is definitely fair game on all fronts. Um, let me actually look. Yes, this problems especially. Um, you know, one thing I'll tell you when I took the class, this was my problem when I took the class. So if you can do this, you, you could have done my exam, which I took a century ago, a centurity ago. Um, cool. All right. So we'll get through this. Uh, and again, any concepts we want to talk about, we'll get we'll talk about them here. Yeah. Um, cool. So let's just get through with it. Um, aiming for an hour today. Aiming for an hour. All right, so first multiple choice, uh, which alkene produces the most stable intermediate after treatment with proton? So again, proton, right? These alkenes are gonna attack the proton and they form carbocation intermediate. So really, I mean, I didn't put carbocation here because I wanted you guys to think about what that intermediate will be, but for the most part, right? Carbocation intermediate is what's going on with all of them. So for all of these, we can add a, a carbocation. Um, I wrote these problems so that you wouldn't really have to think about where the cation would form. Um, you could just place it where you wanna place it. So a lot of you guys would want to place it right on that more supposition, which is not a bad idea. Right, so we can go ahead and do that. Okay. So go ahead and do that there. Okay. And so you could place this, 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 and this. And again, assess for all of these, which one has the best cation overall. Okay. So for most of you, you might see, you know, this is sort of the neutral standpoint is the secondary carbocation with a CH3. Reminder that CH3s can donate to sp2 carbons via hyperconjugation, right? That's the effect behind it. And this donation effect overall stabilizes the cation. So we're looking for stabilizing effects from the neighboring substituents to pretty much determine whether something is more stable or not. Now, obviously this will not be the answer to this question, but we can use it as a standard, right? Hyperconjugation can, hyper -conjugation can donate in. So is there any effect we can use that might donate out, right? Is there any way that we can make this cation less stable? One thing we could do is change those H3s into F3s, right? Fluorines are incredibly electronegative and they're going to pull on this. In fact, this cation would probably never want to exist because of this pulling um, interaction. So remember, it's not about just memorizing that more subcarbons form better cation. It's about understanding what is the effect at play, right? If it's only alkyl groups or R chain, right? Then obviously substitution of that of those Rs, which are just going to give more and more inductive effects, are going to determine stability. But for the rest of these, right, we might have other effects involved. For example, we have an oxygen with its lone pair right next to the cation, right? And a nitrogen with a lone pair next to its cation. So you can imagine the lone pairs next to cations, no lone pairs next to P orbitals, right? Those lone pairs want to resonate. And so that's the dominant effect that we see in, in these guys here. Okay where we might notice, oh, okay, these cations, in fact, these cations don't even really exist, right? Uh, if anything, um, they're being resonance stabilized by that uh, next, short, um, next short header atom. Now, yes, these carbocations may not be the best, right? Or I guess uh, nitrogen and ox oxygen cations might not be the best, but they are still, you know, they are just a part of the resonance hybrid, right? Um, we, we definitely know that those cations are being stabilized. And so generally speaking, hyperconjugation is a weaker effect Right, because hyperconjugation, if you think about it, is really like an inductive effect, right? It's weaker effect compared to resonance. Resonance usually is better. Okay. So at least in terms of ranking, the more stable cations will be one of these two. And this will be sort of stabilized, but it's gonna be less than them. So it's gonna be like if I want to rank like a three, right? And then one of these two will be a two or a one. Now, determine which one determines the better cation will just be who donates better. So who is more willing to give up its electrons? Is it going to be nitrogen or oxygen? Another way to think about this is who's more willing to carry that cation, right? Oxygen is electronegative, hates cations, loves its electrons, so it's less likely to donate, although it will donate. So if I wanted to rank these, right, N right next to this cation with its lone pair will be the best, absolute most stable cation. 
oxygen on the other hand, not so much, right? It's it's going to be a little less willing to give up electrons, although it does, right? I mean, it, it give, I mean, it does resonate, right? But it's less willing to give them up, so it's a little bit worse. So in terms of a ranking, right? We have a one, two, and then a three. Why is this cation absolutely the worst? Well, we can just imagine the resonance structure here, right? Where there's a cation right here as well and an anion here as well, right? That pi bond is polarized to that oxygen and two cations next to each other are absolutely terrible. So two cations next to each other, very, very bad. Um, you can imagine this carbonyl is actually a very good withdrawing group, right? It's going to withdraw a lot um, and it's resonance withdrawing as well. So actually, this is not the actual resonance form we would see. So I know we put a cation here. That was just to show you that this question was foolproof. You could have messed it up, so would got so could have gotten it right. But in fact, if we were to draw the resonance form, um, the cation actually shows up on the primary carbon. So it's actually a primary cation, and a lot of you think probably thinking, oh, that can't exist. That's terrible. And to some extent, yes, that is true. It can't exist, but it still does. Um, this is actually a special kind of cation. We'll talk about at the end of the quarter um, why it can't exist and why you know as opposed to a normal car primary carbon cation. But because it is primary, it is the least stable cation out of all of these. And in fact, this alkene here, because it is electron deficient, it is a cationic, um, cationic pi bond. Um, this actually is very, very slow. So we could also even ask this question from the point of view of which one reacts the fastest, right? Because again, if these are cationic intermediates, the fastest forming cation is the cation that reacts the fastest. So still, this would be the fastest, right? Because it forms the cation the best and therefore then the fastest. Um, this would be the slowest at doing electrophilic addition reactions. So this could have been E here, right? It didn't really matter. So all of our reactions where electrophilic addition matter, like all those reactions where it matters, right? Um, these, you know, this is also the ORW tendency. Now, one thing that I don't do a lot in these that I should start doing, I really should have, and I'll make a point to, I'll make a point of this when I write, when I put this in the Discord. Um, not only can you be asked to select a correct answer, but you can also be asked to rank. Ranking is a big thing in this class too. Um, and so that's why I'll make an effort with these. If there's any type of ranking, we will do that, especially with B. We can do a ranking in B. Definitely we could do a ranking in B. Okay. So also start practicing your ranking, right? Um, putting something as the best versus the worst, right? Most stable, least stable type thing. Okay. Cool. All right. So that's the first one. Second one is which reagent is the strongest base? And so remember, strongest base means the least stable cation, or sorry, anion. Um, and so we can imagine that all we have to look at here is basicities or acidities. And so I will generally write again the, the acidities of, an, or like, uh, you know, the acidity of, of a proton, right? But sp3c, right? Generally the worst, a good value to know this is around 50, right? Followed up by sp2c. Again, very, very bad. Um, this is generally around 45, followed up very closely by the sp3nh, right? This is usually around 35. Interestingly enough, is beat by the sp alkyne proton, so that orbital effect pulling over time here, that 25, followed up by RO minuses or you know sp3OHs. Right, sp3OH is typically around um, 15, followed up by sp3SH. Right, this is around 10 followed up by then the sp2 carboxylic acid. So this is like an sp2OH kind of. Um, this is around five. And then we have our HX is incredibly low, right? So if you know this, I, I mean, I, you can notice that I did something here. I made the numbers pretty round. I made them pretty easy to remember. 5, 10, 15, 25, 35, 45, 50, right? That's something you could spend some time trying to memorize, right? If you understand this pattern, um, you can get any of these correct, right? So in terms of just which is the strongest base, I'm going to go ahead and, or actually, I don't have to clear the screen. I can just bring this down one. Oh, we're done, down, down a little bit. Um, but if, if we just use this trend, right, we can see, okay, we have an SP2, we have an O minus, we have N minus, and then we have the alkyne, right? Clearly, this guy is going to be the strongest base. So this is the strongest base. Out of all of these, the weakest base is this guy. So this is the weakest base. But let's also try to rank them, where four is the be uh, four is the strongest and one is the weakest, right? Um, or one is the strongest base, let's say. So this would be the strongest base, followed up by the amine. So this is the trick question usually because people want to put this as two, followed up by the alkyne, followed up by the oxygen. Okay. So as long as you understand how to rank these, or I mean, if you understand this trend here, you pretty much know how to rank all these questions, right? Um, or at least how to choose who is the strongest or who the weakest base. Okay. That's usually what it boils down to. Cool. All right. We'll call it on that question right there. 
Um, which alkene isomer is E? So this is goes back to SP3 rule, or sorry, uh, RS rules. Um, the way you do it is you choose one side of the pi bond, you choose who gets priority. Branches, when it's alkyl chains, right, branches tend to win. So this guy wins here. And then we look at the other side, sulfur versus fluorine, right, first differences. Um, actually, let's do it by first differences so we have something consistent. So here, first differences, F versus sul uh, sulfur, sulfur wins. That's a heavier one. Um, and then here, first difference, we have a carbon bound to two other carbons and the carbon bound to three hydrogens. So this one's heavier, right? These are on the same side of the pi bond. So this is going to be Z, so not the answer. Again, here we have two methyls. So actually, can't be E or Z because there's two methyls. How do, we, how do we predict? But if I wanted to predict from here, H loses to everything. So that would be what I would choose, but it's not going to be the answer. Again, first differences, I versus BR. I is heavier, so I wins. And then again, first differences, we have a branching carbon, but we have a sulfur, so sulfur wins. This is the E isomer. This is our answer, okay? Um, again, here, you can kind of see it, right? This is a cis alkene or a Z alkene, but we could still go through the thing, right? Where we look, this is a carbon bound to a carbon versus a CH3, so this wins. And then again, this wins, so this is C. Okay, cool. All right, this is usually, sometimes you get this question, sometimes you won't. All right, which bond is the shortest? So this is always a tricky one. Um, Again, if you think about bond length, sp, sp2, sp3, right? Bond length increases this way. So anything you know involving sp3 is not going to be the answer, or anything involving sp might be the answer. So let's just get rid of things that don't have you know the shortest bonds possible. This is all sp3, so that's really long. Um, sp3, sp2, not the best, right? So probably not the answer. These are both involving alkynes, so sp. Here we have a bond between an sp3 atom. So we have a bond between an sp3 atom and an sp atom. So that might be pretty short. Here we have an sp bonding with something that usually bonds with an s orbital. So let's imagine we have a short orbital, both the same size. So short orbital, both the same size, where one is bonding with an s orbital and one is bonding with an sp3 orbital, right? Which bond is going to be the shorter one? So is this one here. So it's a very common trick question. Um, this is going to be the answer here. Okay, so not only is it that's a you know bonding to an sp atom, it's also the fact that it's you know bonding to um, a another atom that has a very short pi bond or sorry very short um, orbital. Cool. All right. Again, we could rank here as well, right? Again, this is obviously going to be the shortest. So we'll give this one, right? The next one will be this two. This would be three, and this would be four, right? In terms of four being the longest bond, one being the shortest. Cool. All right, we got the multiple choice really fast there, so that's pretty good. Um, Nomenclature, figure it out. I know a couple of you are having problems with the, um, with putting, you know, using the online chem draw tool. I know that on Mac, it's not the most friendly thing. So I'll make sure to get the keys out as soon as I can, just so you guys just have them and you can just look at the keys and have the answers. Okay. I'm literally, all I'm doing is in the chem draw program, you can take this and literally have it give you the name, which is what every scientist in the world does. So it makes absolutely zero sense that we teach the skill anymore. It's useless, absolutely useless. But let's go. We are in the um, in the predictive products. Again, we have 10 of these. These are, for the most part, pretty simple, I think, as long as you knew the trends. Okay. So we'll start with A. We have an alkyne. We're reacting with one equivalent HCl, ROR. Again, you see ROR, and you want to think instantly, oh, that's the anti-Markovnikov. So we're going to get this chlorine here. But remember, this is only the case if this is bromide, right? Bromide is the only atom or sulfur on that. On that. So it just could have been sulfur, too. Right. These are the only two people that can go here. Anti Markovnikov. Very common trick question. Chlorine will actually add over here. It'll add in the Markovnikov position or the Morse position. Um, so look out for that. Watch out for that. Okay. But again, if this were HBr roar, yes, for sure. This will add to the less set position. So actually, in the in the first video, I did make a little bit of a mistake, so I want to correct that because I'm proud of doing the last one. But I mentioned for this reaction here, again, if you do HBr and ROR, again, you get exactly what you want where the bromine adds here. Um, but HCl and ROR, right, don't do that. Um, I erroneously drew this product here, but actually, again, it goes through a cation. So, it, you know, the chlorine goes here um, through a rearrangement. So, again... That's even more proof that you guys should be drawing your cations when you when you whenever you should, um, because even I forget or make mistakes when I don't draw the cation. Okay, so especially with you guys, I mean, if the genius in the room can't do it right, and you know everyone else should probably take you know take that as as like a sign that oh I should draw the cation just to make sure I don't mess anything up. Okay, cool. All right. 
Now, one cool thing, let's let's say this was an excess. So let's say that we did this in excess, right? So first let's consider the excess of HCL. Um, the excess of HCL would go here. So that, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because again, it's it's as if the roar is not even there, right? That's as if roar is not even there, right? But if I did excess HBR, R -O -O -R -O -O -R, I think a lot of you might instinctively do this, right? A lot of you want to do that. And I can see why, because it's supposed to be anti-Markovnikov. But in fact, actually, the answer would be this in excess. So a lot of you probably thinking, what in the world's going on? Well, it, it all boils down to the intermediate. Um, if, you're, if you do the ROR reaction, remember, you're forming bromine radical. And, and that's why this reaction actually even forms that anti-Markovnikov um, bromide in the first place. Because the radical intermediate that's more stable is this one here, right? Um, versus this one here, because of, I mean, you can use cation rules for this. Um, hyperconjugation is what stabilizes it. Uh, but right, what we're adding first is the bromide. So the bromide has to go in the quote unquote anti Markovnikov composition. Okay? So that's what kind of dictates this. So we want to put the radical there, and then this quenches with the proton. Okay? Uh, so essentially an H radical, right? It's so good to hear. So that's why this reaction works, is because we're considering the stability of the, of the, um, the radical after addition. Okay? Now, when we get to the second addition here, sorry, when we get to the second addition here, and we're considering how this breaks, again, we might be really willing to think, oh, okay, the radical wants to form here, right? Because that's secondary and that's the most stable position. But in fact, the most stable radical is actually this one here. This is actually the most stable radical that can form in this. Um, and the reason for that is because of um, hyperconjugative effects, right? Um, or at least, uh, heteroatom hyperconjugate effects. When carbon donates electrons hyperconjugatively, it's it's very much a sort of, you know, in, more of like an inductive effect, really. Um, but when it comes to uh, heteroatoms, it's much more of a prominent lone pair donation um, in, in the hyperconjugative sense. Okay. So it's a much more prominent effect. Actually, this is even like, this is even more possible if you have like an, like an oxygen or a nitrogen, these guys are definitely willing to uh, form radicals right next door. Okay. So that's why we kind of tell you guys, if you know the cation trends, you know what the, like the uh, radical trends are, because they tend to mirror each other, although they aren't usually the same. They just tend to mirror each other in terms of results. Okay. So very difficult question. Um, not one that I think would show up, but it's one, you know, it's a good one to know in the back of your head, right? That in fact, the anti-Markovnikov results of um, the vinyl halide addition of, of um, our HBRRR is actually the uh, the dihalide, which if you think about it, this is, you know, the reason why we don't really teach this because you can just get this with BR2. So why, you know, what's the point of this other than a mental exercise? Okay, cool. All right, cool example. Moving on, we have this alkene here. We're doing the BH3 reaction. So again, that will give us the oxygen on the less substitute position, which a versus B, that's going to be B, right? Um, I didn't do a very good job in this question. I guess I, sh I should have done this, honestly, so that you would, this would matter. But remember that this is our sin reaction. So if we form an OH here with a wedge, right, the H here will also add as a wedge, right? Or if we, you know, if we have an, uh, the OH adding as a, on the dash face, then the H will add on the dash face as well. Now, this really only makes sense if they're both, both carbons are chiral, which I should have made sure to do, but I didn't. That's my bad. Um, but I would always highly recommend just drawing something sin or anti if that's the point of the reaction. So, for example, if we did Br2 here, yes, it is the case that one Br will be, um, you know, like one Br will be a chiral, so it doesn't really matter. But I just highly recommend just doing it. Um, you won't be hurt for drawing it in as a wedge or a dash right? If it's not supposed to be chiral, but it, it can in assist you in showing, oh, the TA, oh, you knew it was anti, you knew it was um, what it was supposed, like anti or sin, um, and that can just help you. So in the key, I will reflect this change. I'll make this my methyl here. So it matters. Um, but if you had, if you had done it, that's totally fine. I just want to really push that point of, you know, you really want to make sure that something is sin or anti, right? For example, another sin reaction is the, uh, the dihydroxylation, right? It does not hurt to draw the stereochemistry in, right? If anything, it might even help you because it shows your idiot, or <laughs> why did I say idiot? Um, it shows your TA that um, you're, you're, you're not, uh, you know, you didn't just memorize these, you understand them, right? Cool, all right, cool. Moving on, we have an alkyne here. Now, one little cool thing here is this is an asymmetric alkyne. So whatever reaction I do, um, unless it adds the same thing across the pi bond, I don't really know where things are gonna go. So for example, doing the Br2H2O reaction, 
right? Uh, if you wanted to go through this mechanistically, right? Triangle, um, and then, right, the water can open this, but water doesn't really know where to open here, right? Or at least it doesn't have a decision. Maybe more often than not, it might open here. So product distribution might be swayed that way because this is a methyl versus a, um, a, a, an isopropyl type carbon um, right here. But it, I mean, generally don't really know where it's gonna go. So for asymmetrics, right? You can get opening on either side or sorry, yeah, on either side. Um, so we can get a water addition here or we can get uh, right, a water addition on the other side. Right, um, and then remember there's an enol in there. So don't forget enols tautomerize. Um, this is gonna turn into the alpha bromoketone as such and, and same thing here. Okay, so these are the results. So whenever you have an asymmetric, always keep in mind that these two are possible. The only time this wouldn't really be an issue is if you did like X2, because X2 adds the same thing across the pi bond four times. Um, so, I mean, this is only one possible isomer, but like if I did like an HCl reaction, right, or an HBr reaction, again, I don't know which carbon we're going to add those H's on and which the Cl go on, because they're the same. So we would get two answers for that. Okay, cool. All right. So enough with that one. That's just that one there. Oh, I guess one thing to note then is that if it's symmetric, then it will give one answer because uh, whether, so let's say we do the bromine reaction, whether water opens up here or here doesn't matter. It's identical. So this would give you one answer if it's symmetric. Cool. All right. Moving on. Um, D, we have a, a symmetric alkyne. So I guess clearly I was thinking about this when I wrote this. Um, the first step gives you the transalkyne versus, or sorry, alkene versus the cis one. If we did Linlar's catalyst, we would get cis here. And then from there, we can just do our reaction. So Br2H2O will give us a Br. And again, it doesn't really matter here which one we get um, because again, whether OH opens on the left or right is going to be the same. Uh, so we'll get both of these possibilities here because again, I don't know if the bromonium formed as a wedge or a dash. And then the second step, uh, the third step is OH minus, which the most acidic proton is the OH here. We had O minus here. And remember, so we'll just close on this and form epoxides. So we'll just form um, either the wedge face or the dash face here, which again, if you kind of think about it, doesn't this doesn't really change anything. Um, cool. All right. Yeah, this is a symmetric product, so it doesn't matter. Cool. You can, again, you could change this by having done Linlars and doing this sequence. I would have just given you this, right? Yada, yada. You guys get it. Cool. All right. If I look at E, again, E, if I try to think about the cation that would form, I could either, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I'll form this one here so you can see what I wanted you to do, but this is just going to rearrange, right? Because we have a secondary cation next to tertiary center. So it will form this cation here. And then the water will capture on that cation. Okay. So we'll get OSG plus, and then something will deprotonate into the alcohol. Okay. So a lot of you might be thinking, well, what if the cation formed on the other carbon? That's totally possible, right? Um, that, that's, uh, that's totally possible cation forms here, and then we get this here, right? Um, but remember that acid is a very equilibrating, it's a very thermodynamic condition for, um, for alkenes and, and, and you know, alcohols as well. Um, so this could easily get protonated, right? We could get cation here, and possibly the alkene could reform, or maybe if we put a you know, high enough temperature, this could even just rearrange you know, form this cation here anyways, and then this will just go ahead and attack it anyway. So think of acid again as an equilibrating um, situation, right? I mean, that's the whole reason why we develop the uh, non-rearranging the non -rearranging, um, equivalence of these reactions, because it's such an issue, right? The rearrangement. Um, if I'd done like an X2 reaction, right? Obviously this would prevent this from happening, right? We would get this isomer and then the, you know, the diastereomer, because we don't know where this methyl is. So we can't say this is racemic, but we can draw that either one of these two could form, right? Um, cool, it's a possibility. So again, the triangles, again, their whole motivation is how do we prevent that cation from rearranging? Because it's such an issue in acid, right? So you always be considering that that could happen. Cool. I believe also in your notes, you guys have an example where this happens in a six member drink, right? Where it's like something like this and then like you're doing like H3PO4 or something. I didn't do very many examples with H3PO4. I apologize, but it's the same thing as H2SO4, right? This rearranges into the uh, this alcohol here. 
Cool. All right. Moving on. Um, F is a bit of a hard one, but nothing, nothing is too bad in that sense, right? We have uh, any, we have this mixture here. This is just Jones. So that turns our carboxylic acid into this. And so you can kind of see we have this sort of alkene with a, you know, uh, functional, functionally nucleophilic arm. If I draw the I2 intermediate, right, that forms this here. It shouldn't really surprise any of you guys, right? We get a cyclization there, right? So one, two, three, four, five. We get a five-membered ring with the oxygen in it. Let me do some counting here. One, two, three, four, and five. So oxygen's one, two, three, four, and five. Looks like the carbonyl is on five here. And then two, two was attacked. Um, so it has a methyl on it with, or some carbon on it with the iodide um, on there. And so this is actually a very common sequence in uh, medicinal chemistry. This is known as iodolactonization. Iodolactonization. There's a lot of reasons to use this. Primarily, this is used as a, as a protecting group. You guys will learn what those are later in the course. Uh, but it's used widely in medicinal chemistry to cyclize on alkenes. Okay. Lactone comes from this functional group here. We call this an ester, but when we have an ester ring, we call it a lactone. So iodo for the iodine and then lactonization. Sometimes you'll even see halo lactonization. Um, for that purpose, okay? What is the pyridine? The pyridine just deprotonates the carboxylic acid. It makes it a better nucleophile, but it doesn't matter. It still would have worked anyways without it. I just included it just to be very particular. Now, one thing you guys might've noticed and might've had trouble with is the fact that if I attack here, this gives a five-membered ring, but if I attack here, this gives a six-membered ring. So what gives, right? What do I go with? Now, when it comes to reaction kinetics, um, generally speaking, the kinetics for five are faster than the kinetics for six. And actually even faster than six is gonna be three. So that's why epoxides form, right? It's because they, they, they're they the fastest forming ring. Um, so three is faster than five is faster than six. So actually, let's do this. So let's let's put these in an order, right? Um, this order here is kinetics, right? And, and this order here is thermodynamics. Now with the cyclizing reactions, both of them are under what we call kinetic control. So we want to follow the kinetic line. Okay. Um, a good question for this will always make sure the five is more substituted than the six so that you don't have to really worry about where it goes. Um, if six is more substituted, then it will depend on what control you have. Um, that's what makes this question really, really hard because you guys haven't even learned kinetic and thermodynamic control. So I would almost always go with the kinetic arrow uh, just because all these reactions you can always argue are kinetically done. Um, thermodynamics take a long time usually. And I mean, for the most part, most reactions, kinetics and thermodynamics line up, but you can see here it doesn't. They are in fact different, right? Kinetics for ring formations are not the same as thermodynamics. Six is always more stable than five and three. But five does form faster than six. So always go with five if you have to choose between five and six and you can always argue uh, kinetics, sorry. Cool, all right. Moving on to G, we have H2 Linlar. So we wanna turn our alkyne into an alkene. In particular, we want to turn into a cis alkene. Now this alkene might throw you guys off, but just keep in mind that this alkene currently is just trans. So when I form this al uh, alkyne, sorry, when I form the alkene from the alkyne here, right? I just want to make sure it's cis. And then I just have to make sure this alkene is trans. So instead of going down like that, I just need to go up like that. So this, uh, this is trans, this is cis, everyone is happy, right? Remember, Linlars does not react with alkenes. That's why that guy is untouched. Uh, but if I did do just H2, right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that would just give me the seven membered alkane here. So this heptane. Okay. Let's say that I did um, NA, 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 NH3, right? Again, I just need to make sure. So let's say I did NA, NH3. I just need to make sure this is a trans alkyne. And then the other alkyne was also, sorry, alke sorry I need to make a trans alkene. Um, I would just do it this way to make things a little bit easier. And then again, just make sure the other one is also trans as well because it started off as trans. Okay, cool, super simple, not too bad. Last but not least, we have a symmetric alkyne. So if we react with anything, it'll just form this one product, one, two, three, four, five, six. So a six carbon chain, right? It's excess, so we're gonna add chlorine twice. If it were Cl2, right, it would just, um, oh, sorry, wrong carbon, right? If it were Br2, or Cl2, right? It would just in, like entirely brominate the tetrabromide, right? Really give off um, that there was an alkyne there. Okay, cool. So let that gem geminal um, uh, interaction or that geminal identity um, give give away the alkyne. 
right? Ha, huh, maybe, maybe this geminality here is giving away that there's an alkyne. Interesting, right? Cool. All right. Um, last but not oh, that was the last one. Okay, so cool. We'll call it on there. Uh, this was actually pretty simple. This was actually not too bad. I thought I wrote these to be a bit harder, but they're not too bad. I mean, this is, again, about the uh, difficulty you would expect on the exam. Um, gym term four, or sorry, uh, gym term 1D, a little bit higher than this. So it's okay if that one's a bit of a struggle. Cool. Mechanism. So again, uh, this is actually a three-step sequence that you guys should all have memorized down into you know the, the depths of your brain, right? This will make an alkyne from an alkene. So easy to predict this. Um, the reason why we're doing the whole mechanism is because there's enough arrows, enough uh, enough time to write out the whole thing. Um, it's not too bad of a mechanism. Usually this is asked on the terminal though, and you'll see why in a second. So again, with the triangles, super simple, right? We just attack something, we attack back and we lose something. So what we're gonna get is gonna be the bromonium ring, which that other bromine can then go ahead and open on the more sub position, which is the general trend that we see. And there we go, we finished the triangle part. Okay. The next part is now just the eliminations. Um, a lot of people always ask me this, does it matter which side I start from elimination? Generally speaking, with these kinetically controlled, or I'll, I'll try not to use kinetic here, but uh, generally speaking, I mean, both these, both of these sets of hydrogens are equally acidic because they're both next to a bromide, so something electronegative. Um, it's just a matter of who has more, right? Just It's more likely that this one eliminates first. So we eliminate that internal bromide first, usually. Um, and then, right, if we think about the most like proton, um, usually going to be this one here. Um, so we can get an elimination there, right? Um, and then we'll get out the alkyne, okay? Now, when we get to this alkyne, right, we have three equivalents of NaNH2. So what gives, right? What's the point of, what's the point of that? Well, that NH2 minus is used to deprotonate the alkyne, okay? So that's used to deprotonate the alkyne. And then water right? Oak oxygen being more acidic than an, an alkyne, right? It's just used to protonate the alkyne into this here. So why do we do this, right? Didn't we already make the product here? Remember the concept behind using 2EQ versus 1EQ, uh, sorry, 2EQ versus 3EQ, right? The point is with terminals, when NaNH2 right, first forms the first alkyne and it redoes the sequence of deprotonating here, deprotonating here, right? Well, you're asking NaNH2 to choose an sp3 hydrogen or an sp2 hydrogen over an sp hydrogen which we already just talked about earlier is a pk of 25. so if you only use two equivalents um you, you know halfway through the reaction once you have a sizable amount of this alkyne this alkyne is going to start quenching um out your and um your nanh2 right you're going to lose out on half your equivalent um of nanh2 that's just spending time deprotonating these alkynes so this process here is not going to be facilitated the first deprotonation into the alkene and then into the alkyne so that's why we need three EQs. We need one to do the first elimination, which is the hardest because it's on an sp3 carbon. Then we need one to do it on the sp2, which is a little bit easier. And then we need one to do it on the sp, which is the easiest proton to take. So your NaNH2 will always take it. So if I use two equivalents, right? Um, your second equivalent is going to be used up quenching this guy. So you're going to have half unreacted. You're going to mean you're going to have half alkyne anion and half unreacted product. Right? Half unreacted of this guy here. Okay, cool. So that's the whole point behind that. But other than that, pretty good. Um, in terms of alkyne uh, mechanisms, uh, let me actually even pull up the review doc for this. Okay. Um, oh, oops, I did not mean to open it up there. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see that now. Um, in terms of alkyne mechanisms, sorry, let me just get rid of this. Um, for the most part, I mean, really the only ones you'd want to know, there's that thing, by the way, um, considering the, uh, the hybrid conjugative effects, right, that I was talking about earlier. Um, really the ones to know are the ones that are in your notes, which I think, I mean, definitely this one here is in your notes. Um, and then I think these mercuric ones are in your notes. The tautomerization is a very popular mechanism, which again is super simple. I mean, in terms of the enol reaction, uh, enol to keto is in acid is super simple. Um, in base, super simple. They're both like the same number of steps. It's just a matter of do I protonate first because I'm in acid, or do I deprotonate first because I'm in base, and then you know facilitating the movement of that proton. Uh, but it's pretty, pretty, pretty. Uh, 
easy to do. Look at this. This is so perfect, right? This is the perfect boration reaction. You set up the anti-Markovnikov, you, you, uh, you add in the oxygen and then you replace the bromide and then you hydrolyze the bromide off or sorry, the uh, boron. Um, that's what I'm going to say, the borons. Oh, so, so easy. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Six arrows uh, or seven and eight, I guess, but seven, eight arrows, such a perfect one. That one is right. Um, but yeah, um, cool. Anyways, looking at this, I mean, not too crazy, not too bad. Um, I, I guess this is also an acceptable mechanism is the, uh, the, um, the birch reduction. This one's also a pretty good one. Um, not too bad. You know, let's actually even talk about this. Um, the birch reduction might seem very crazy, but it's the same thing twice, right? Um, really the birch reduction, when we think about it is it's, it's a solution of electrons. So when you add in NA into ammonia, it turns out actually you're not, you don't actually have NA or ammonia. You actually have a, uh, complex. It's like NA, it's like NA NH3 to like, uh, I don't know, to like, I think like six of these or something like that. Anyways, it's some number here. And then you actually have free electron. It's a solvated electron solution. So that's why we call these dissolving metal reductions because you dissolve the metal in and you suddenly have an electron juice. So you have electron Kool-Aid basically. Um, and and essentially these electrons are looking to reduce things, right? They're looking to add to um, substrates. So in terms of alkynes, um, you're essentially adding electron juice into the alkyne to form the radical anion, which forces it's forced anti because it hates being next to each other. And then we quench it with the ammonia proton. So add an electron and then quench. And guess what? We just do the same thing over again, right? Because now we have one H set. So we just add electron and we quench. So reactions like these, again, look for those patterns, right? Helping to, you know, talking yourself through why something is working is really going to help make those neurolog neurological bridges uh, that make these uh, reactions make more sense. Okay, cool. And then again, if you see deuterium, don't be afraid, right? Deuterium is your friend. Oh, what the heck? That should have been deuterium. My bad. Um, I mean, I always make these very late at night, so it makes sense why it may see some. Um, this section here was just to show you cool ways to do these cyclizations or, you know, alkyne transformations, stuff like that, um, and just different pathways you can take. So just kind of, I mean, really shouldn't memorize any of this, just understand, look at the patterns, um, things we're able to achieve. Um, this year is pretty cool, especially for gym term 1D. This, this pathway is pretty cool. Okay, cool. All right. Oh, this is an epoxide, by the way. I don't know why that wasn't drawn in. This should be an epoxide here. All right. But anyways, uh, just wanted to go over that just to show that, um, just keep that in mind. Cool. So let's just move on now into the syntheses. Um, Hopefully these were not too bad. Let's actually start with the bottom one. This was the one, again, on my exam when I took the class. Um, if we kind of look at this, I mean, we have three carbon chain going to four. So some kind of Grignard is involved here. Uh, and it's it's pretty obvious what kind of Grignard we want to use here, right? whether we use an sp3, sp2, or sp type Grignard, because we have the geminality. Um, this should instantly just kind of tell you, right? These two carbons here definitely were my alkyne. So I use an excess of Br2 in CCL4, right? And that gives me this here, okay? Um, and then if I think about this carbonyl here, carbonyls always come from oxidation. In the case of, right, an aldehyde, aldehyde comes from PCC oxidation of a primary alcohol, right? Again, if these are my three original carbons, uh, this is my one new carbon here. I can think about cutting this here. I use an alkyne anion. Remember, if you think about Grignards, right, the best Grignard to use is an alkyne anion. So you use NaNH2. And then because there's an alcohol here, I either could have used a ketone or a, um, I could have used a ketone or I could have used a um, epoxide. Since the carbon we deattach is right next to the alcohol, that's pretty much a carbonyl, right? In this case, the carbonyl is going to be, when I take this and I get rid of the O and draw a double bond, formaldehyde right? Um, more juice, basically. Um, but yeah, I think they use these in morgues, right? I think so. I might be wrong about that, maybe. I associate death with formaldehyde, to be honest. Um, it's that smell, right? I, I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Anyways, cool. I mean, now from here to here, it's pretty simple. Turn my, uh, turn my alkane into an alkyne. Alkyne synthesis comes from an alkene, right? That's just Br2 into um, NaNH2. Right, uh, and in this case, it is. I mean, if you put excess here, you don't have to put three because uh, then you just use as much as you need. Um, and then we can make alkenes from bromides, and we can make bromides from alkanes. Okay, so look at that perfect, 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 perfect. Um, 
retrosynthetic analysis. Okay, cool. Now, the only way that I would change this to make it a little bit better, uh, again, remember that idea that if I have a pi bond next to an electron withdrawing group, it makes it a worse, um, it makes it a worse nucleophile. Um, so it actually, I would reverse the order of these two steps. I would say PCC would be last. Um, so we'd have the alcohol here. Okay, and then I would do the Br2 um, reaction. Um, a couple of you might be wondering, oh, well, wouldn't the alcohol kind of mess this up a little bit? Uh, because technically you could form this and possibly that could attack there. Um, that, that definitely is a possibility. Um, but this is not a very, not a very uh, stable structure whatsoever. Um, if anything, it would, I mean, the, the next BR would definitely crack that open right there, without a, without a doubt. Um, as in, like, we would get to here and then, what the heck? There we go. Right, we would, we would <laughs> look at this nightmare, right? Um, it would definitely crack open that carbon, um, the, the next BR. So we would still get the installation of the, of the bromo species. Or we would, I mean, we'd still end up with the halide we want. The epoxide probably just, I mean, makes it a little bit faster, right? If you wanted to consider that. So if, if you were, if you're considering that this is a possibility, there is still a way to get to um, uh, the answer we need. Okay, cool. All right. And actually, uh, to be completely honest with you guys, alkyne mechanisms, I mentioned this in the last video, they're all kind of lies. Um, no one, no one really wants to spend money to understand how kinds work and no one really wants to rewrite the textbooks because you know, one thing no one really questions is why is it that this reaction here, um, if it supposedly goes through a cation, uh, right. Cause supposedly this goes through a cation, right. Why does this not rearrange? Because aren't SP3 cations more stable than SP, SP2? Um, why is it that they, why is it that they don't rearrange? And the answer is because this is actually not really, um, a, a cationic mechanism, um, currently, the accepted model is that there is some kind of, uh, it's really, it's so wild. I can find the reference for anyone who's, who's like interested, but a bunch of these, um, this is called a SN, it's some kind of assisted substitution. Uh, but essentially, there is a complexation uh, that goes across this, or, I mean, some people even think that it, it would work this way. That, that even this chlorine isn't even enticed to attack. It's kind of like a term molecular type thing. So it's a bunch of complexations that happen um, and it's all mediated via, you know, solvent stabilization. So, um, you know, <laughs> if you get an alkyne mechanism and, you know, if you get it wrong, you'd always think to yourself, oh, well, no one even, not, not even my professor knows what's going on here because in reality, no one really knows what's going on with these mechanisms. It's, it's so weird and wild. Okay. So cool. All right. Anyways, that's the first one. A second one. First one, also pretty simple, right? We're going from a cycle and breaking it open into a chain. I mean, again, we're breaking a CC bond. So uh, you could even start from the beginning here because it's clear we're doing osmolysis. So this is an easier way to see osmolysis. Um, again, always the first reaction you can do is a Br2. And then I'll just do a terpetoxide. That just forces, right? That just forces that there. I can do an O3 into whatever reducing agent I want. Um, this will initially give me aldehydes. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, but I need to turn to ketones where I add a carbon. So I can do an excess of CH3 um, Li, which will give me right the alcohols that I need. And then this just oxidize PCC or Jones, whatever you want. Okay. So that one's not too bad. This was uh this was also a previously, you know, this is a favorite, I would say. Okay. Cool. All right. So, I mean, really with these questions, it doesn't get much more crazier than this. Um, Again, is understanding what transformations give you what to look for. Uh, the only, I guess, the only crazier thing maybe is with, I mean, with this one here because when you get that alkyne with the alcohol on, um, there's a lot of things you can do here, right? Like for example, maybe you do NaH into um, Rx, and that gives you right an etherification, and then you do the the bromination, right? So X X X X, right? Um, one two three four, so we'll have this year. So, you know, that's a possibility, right? Not much, not much craziness can really happen beyond this, right? Um, I guess you could have cracked open an epoxide, right? That just makes it longer, the chain. And then everything else you do is just a bit longer. So I guess an epoxide in this case would prevent any, if you want to do X2 shenanigans, like you could do X2 here. And then 
right? We'd have this alcohol and then we could even do a Jones here um, because we wanted to, right? And so that could give us this. Again, using that geminal relationship to tell us that there's an alkyne and then using the uh, alcohol, like the Jones, like carboxylic acid tells there was a Jones, stuff like that. Okay, cool. All right. Um, well, that's that. Uh, and I can talk much more on that. Um, all we have left now is, um, looks like this here, this structure here. So again, all about patterns in this class, right? So I look in the CNMR, I see that there is alkenes going on 100 to 140. So there's an alkene and I have a little bit of a separation. So I'm thinking possibly that stuff I talked about last time where if these were really similar, they'd be within like, you know, within a PPM, but they're um, out almost, uh, or they would be like really close within like half a PPM, but these are about almost a PPM apart. So I'm thinking, I mean, even this is about like 20 apart. So I'm thinking maybe some kind of conjugation effect, um, possibly, right? I'm not sure. Um, but I know, I mean, there's three alkene protons. So I can almost even start drawing that fragment there. I see three alkene protons, right? Uh, this here, the 1H doublet, 1H doublet, 1H multiply is a very good signaling for a terminal alkene. Um, so, you know, pretty, pretty, if you see that, you can just draw that instantly as a fragment. Um, we have a peak here about... 160 to 180, that tells us a derivative. So, um, you know, carbonyl with some group next to it. Um, I have two oxygens, so I'm willing to go on a limb and think that that's a uh, ester of some kind. So remember, how do I tell ketones from esters? Um, is that information there? Uh, let me just do, P let me just do DOU just so I know that there's not, I mean, there's only two, if there's only two, then I got them. If there's three, there might be a ring. So seven times two equals 14. Uh, 14 plus two is 16. Um, Minus one is 15, minus 11 is going to be four over two. That's two degrees. I have my two degrees. Okay. I have my two degrees. So I have an ester and I have an alkene. Um, so I'll even put in the two degrees here. Okay. Look at this. This is already like a point, maybe two points, two points. So five points, maybe out of 10, just from getting these fragments here. Um, maybe, maybe less than that could be three, but I mean, three is better than zero, right? So you could even go there. Um, when I'm thinking about how to build this out of my three fragments so, or out of my two fragments, really, I have an alkene and I have this ester. The ester is the easiest to work with because remember things next to oxygen. So this oxygen ether type thing here going to be really high up. Um, recall that this proton here or these protons here are these here. So we can ignore them. So this 2H here signals to me instantly that um, it's next to the oxygen. So I can draw that in right, that there is a 2H there. So these green H's here, and it is a triplet, which no neighbors here, so they have to be there. So then I have two neighbors right over here, right? Two neighbors right over here. Um, I don't really know what these two H's are as of right now. I mean, there's someone, I just don't know who they are. Right there, there's two of the others of these. Um, so just for the time being, I'm going to kind of ignore that fragment there, but I've kind of got some work going for me. Um, I have another 2H triplet that's really high up. If I look at my formula, I see a bromide. I'm going to assume that those two H's are next to a bromide. So, hey, I'll write in another, another fragment. So actually, let's get rid of this one because we're already working on this one here. Uh, but now I have a bromide fragment where a bromide is next to a CH2 of some kind. And that's also a triplet, right? So it's next to another CH2. So possibly we could have these two guys here. So these two fragments might line up because they, they're following that pattern we're looking for. So maybe I start to even, you know, associate those two together maybe, um, but we'll think about it. Not sure just quite yet. Um, all I have left now is this uh, 2H up near three. Now two H's that are past like two um, usually indicate that there are um, yeah, these guys usually indicate that they are uh, next to like something electronegative, right? So maybe next to the carbonyl or this alkene here. Out of the two of these, so the carbonyl, both the carbonyl and the alkene are pi bonds. The carbonyl has an oxygen. So I'm willing to bet that this 2H is next to the oxygen, um, this one here. So there's a 2H here. Um, and then that's a triplet. So my God, so many triplets, right? It's kind of crazy. Um, so I've got these fragments here and this 2H is also up, up by two. So I'm willing to bet it's next to the alkene. So I've now resolved the alkene fragment, right? Cause I think the alkene will just go here and it's terminal. So I think it's here. Okay. So I've now figured out where this goes. Now all I have left. Yeah, I was right. This goes with the bromide. Okay, cool. All right. So look at that. Just patterns. Uh, pretty much got us through all of this, looking at PPM, stuff like that. 
Um, cool. Now I do have some more and more practice. I'll send the video if anyone needs it. Cause there's now a week. Uh, if you need more and more practice, I'll send it. it's much more to the level of this class. I think some of these were kind of gimmicky, the ones that I wrote. Um, but that's gym term uh, 1C. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I'll, again, I'll try to get 1D done before the weekend, but you know, I, I have to also, uh, I have to write exams for the one or the 118C class and also make their corresponding videos, but you can imagine it takes a lot of my time. So I'll do my best, but at, at the very least, I mean, the first three midterms can carry you, um, give you a very good idea of how to solve questions in this class. Um, so you should be, you know, good with that. I'll, I'll at the very least release a key for the, the fourth one, if I can't make a video. Um, and then you guys can ask me questions about the key. Cool. All right. You guys have a good one. See ya.